It's customary when YouTubers reach particular milestones for them to do something special, something out of the ordinary. Well, thanks to you guys, Iceberg Tech has reached its first major milestone, 1,000 subscribers. To show my appreciation and do something a bit out of the ordinary, it's time to get personal. I mulled over a bunch of ideas of what I wanted to do for the 1000 sub milestone and nothing really seemed to work for me. I didn't want to do a live stream because everything I do is scripted and I'd, I'd be too nervous to go live. I considered doing a face reveal, but I decided to hold on to the mystery a while longer at least. I settled on the idea of taking you through this, my personal PC. Yes, that's right, the RPG PC I use for benchmarking graphics cards is not my personal rig. Check out the video where I talk about that PC later on if you like. Although I cover mainly low-end budget stuff on my channel, I'm afraid I'm a fraud. I have a really pretty good PC with current gen stuff. I bought it all myself, obviously. Nobody's sending me free stuff yet. I guess today my plan is to explain the build, show it off a bit, and benchmark it in games that I like, not just ones I think will appease the algorithm. Before I get into the build, just a quick thanks to Wizzy, my first Patreon patron. I admit I set up the Patreon page out of hope more than anything, and I haven't really done a lot to promote it so far. For the time being there are no tiers or rewards, but if you wanted to throw a coin my way every month to help encourage me to keep going, there's a link in the doobly-doo. So, where to start? Well, I guess there's the case. The Fantex Evolve TG is a pretty sexy case I picked up a few years ago, and one that really stretches the definition of Micro ATX. On the one hand, it has limited my choice of motherboard for the last few builds. On the other hand, it's really, really good looking. It's actually been home to my last three builds, the first a Z270 with an i7 6700K, the second a B450 with a Ryzen 7 2700, and of course this one. The motherboard is an MSI Mortar B550 which I bought on Black Friday 2020 pretty much by mistake. It was a really good price with cashback and a free game, and I thought I'd just be able to replace my old B450. However. I'd forgotten that my Ryzen 7 2700 wasn't supported by B550 boards. Thankfully I quickly managed to pick up a Ryzen 5 5600X at retail price, which was a pretty big deal at the time. My old Ryzen 7 was great for multi-threaded applications, but for games and Photoshop, which is the majority of what I use my PC for, this was a big step up. The motherboard is my third in a row from MSI, partly on the recommendation of Hardware Unboxed, and partly because their mortarboards have this aesthetic that matches the Fantex case really nicely. For cooling I'm using an NZXT X62. I've got it positioned to use the fans as exhausts for the case in a negative pressure configuration. Aside from the RAM and water block, the system is pretty much RGB free. The RAM in question is a couple of 16 gig sticks of Corsair Dominator Platinum I picked up on Black Friday 2020. As I do a fair amount of work in Adobe Photoshop and DaVinci Resolve, 32 gigs of RAM is pretty much a no-brainer for me, and the Dom Plat was a good enough deal that I didn't bother shopping around. The graphics card is a recent acquisition, and although it was technically a scalped price, it could have been worse. I replaced my beautiful Founders Edition RTX 3060 Ti with a slightly less beautiful Gigabyte Gaming OC RTX 3070 that was an open box return from CCL Computers. It cost £650, which is the second highest amount I've ever spent on a graphics card. I previously bought an RX 6700 XT for like 700 quid, because I naively thought it might get a ton of views. Ouch. As you can see, it's a long boy, and that's the reason I've had to flip the AIO round to use as an exhaust. My storage setup is constantly evolving. I use two M.2 SSDs, one 500 gig Samsung NVMe for Windows, Photoshop, Resolve, and scratch disks, and a one terabyte Crucial P2 NVMe for games. I also have a total of seven terabytes of three and a half inch hard drives, which 
I've been trying to convince myself to trade in for a NAS for, oh, about a decade now? <laughs> Maybe next year. Finally, my peripherals. My monitor is a now discontinued ASUS MG279, 27-inch IPS with a resolution of 2560x1440, a 144Hz refresh rate, and AMD FreeSync up to 90Hz. I'm not enough of a monitor nerd to want to upgrade from this yet, and it'll probably stay on my desk for at least a few more years. For speakers, I use a pair of old Q Acoustics bookshelf speakers plugged into a knob sound <coughs> USB amplifier sound card hybrid. The keyboard is a Drevo Tierfing TKL mechanical keyboard with red switches. I've decided I'm not a huge fan of reds, so I might be looking into trying browns next. My mouse is a Logitech G502 Proteus, so I really have no excuse for being as bad at multiplayer shooters as I am. I'm pretty happy overall with my build, and aside from maybe a new keyboard, I don't see myself upgrading next year unless the channel really takes off or next-gen CPUs look like a real game changer. On the subject of game changers, let's change the subject to uh, games. I think that everybody's been pretty hard on the last three Assassin's Creed games, and I understand why, I get it, but I don't agree. Hardcore AC fans think they're too far away from the series' origins, serious reviewers think they're too big and bloated, some knobheads think they're pandering to SJWs, who think that playing any Ubisoft game is supporting... <laughs> well, let's, let's not get into that. I've literally only just got monetized. The thing is, they're all correct. Except the anti-SJW thing, they need to just grow up. The thing is, despite all this, I just love hanging around in ancient Greece. I first played Odyssey on my old i7-6700K system with a GTX 1080, and honestly, I didn't benchmark it, but it wasn't quite enough to play at max settings. My GPU is a little more capable than that one was. At 1440 max settings, I saw just short of 77 FPS on average, with lows in the mid 40s, and an overwhelming feeling of nostalgia, which is weird, as I only played it like two years ago. Another game which satisfied nobody. I wasn't a CDPR fan in advance of Cyberpunk 2077's release. I didn't fall in love with the Witcher series, and most of the pre-release hype for Cyberpunk went right over my head, but it launched at the start of the channel, and I knew I'd have to cover it in some aspect. After I started playing, I just kind of got hooked. I like open-world city games. I've played about 60 hours or so of GTA V, so when you take a version of that and throw in cutting-edge graphics, a modern take on the Blade Runner aesthetic, and RPG elements, you've basically made a game that's perfect for me. I always play with RTX enabled, and as this is the 3070, and not the 3080 I really wanted, I have to make do with DLSS balanced to keep things playable. And, well, it certainly achieves that. Even at 1440 Ultra, with ray tracing turned up to high, the average is holding just over 60 FPS and only dipping into the mid to high 40s. Without DLSS, those same settings result in what can only be described as a slideshow, but I think I'd rather have the occasional DLSS artifact and ultra settings than native 1440 and reduced quality overall. I discovered Subnautica while making a list video for my other channel, where I looked at the best games on Xbox Game Pass at the time. Subnautica was my escape from 2020. Taking a dive in the shallows, harvesting food and resources, building my base, and just enjoying existing in the world were kind of like a therapy for me. The music's incredible and will instantly snap me back to that moment in time. In gaming terms, it's not well optimised. It runs great for a while, but the longer you spend travelling and exploring, the more likely you are to come across some performance issues. Aesthetically, it's lovely to look at, but mainly through its art style, rather than technical wizardry. As a result, it doesn't really challenge the RTX 3070, with 1440 max settings resulting in 139 FPS on average. This is kind of weird to admit, especially for an elder millennial. 
I like Fortnite. Granted, not the way Fortnite fans like Fortnite. I don't build at all, I don't participate in events, I don't use creator mode and I've never spent a penny on it, but as a quick, easy, good looking battle royale that's pretty noob friendly and has uncommonly good visibility for colorblind people, it's probably my favourite BR and certainly the one I suck at least. Before replacing the 3060 Ti with the 3070, I used to run at 1440 Ultra with DLSS quality. And although I didn't ever run a full benchmark, the built-in frame counter tended to hang out in the 200s. I would probably consider going back to those settings, but for the purposes of this video, I wanted to give the new card a workout. 1440 native with high settings and epic view distance results in an average FPS of 137 with 85 1% lows and 0.1% lows down in the 30s. Just lest anyone think that expensive systems can somehow overcome server related jankiness. Another game I initially reviewed for my other channel, I fell in love with Forza Horizon 4 not only for its gameplay and the aesthetic of a rather idealised version of Britain, but also the range of cars and the ease of access. Even though I started playing a couple of years after the game was released, I built up a collection of nearly 200 cars so far, and will probably come back to it from time to time, even after the release of Horizon 5. As mentioned elsewhere on the channel, I found that Forza is wonderfully optimised at high settings and looks damn near identical on medium, but I'm pushing the boat out here. At 1440 Ultra, I'm seeing 126 FPS on average and 1% lows still over 100. This is actually a new one for me. I bought Death Stranding in the Epic Game Store sale last Christmas and didn't really get round to playing it at the time. When I was building my initial list of titles to benchmark in the Tales from the Scalper Pandemic series, it didn't quite make the cut, so I only started playing it for the first time quite recently. My friend who's also a fan of AC Odyssey recommended it very highly, and I'm starting to see what the fuss is about. I'm only about two hours in, of which about 20 minutes has been gameplay, and it's certainly a pretty unique experience. I know in Hollywood it's not uncommon for certain cities and countries to be redressed to look like others, but since when has the US been played by Iceland? Anyway, cutscenes are locked to 60, and as I've implied, the game seems to be very heavy on them, but once I actually get to take control, I'm seeing frame rates of 122, with lows close to 70. On the flip side of Death Stranding, I kinda hate that I picked Control as a benchmark title for my PC builds. I also haven't gotten round to playing the game properly yet, and I find it really intriguing and great to look at, the art style's really nicely done, and Remedy games always have that mysterious, slightly abstract feeling that really makes me want to play more, but I just keep playing the same section over and over for benchmarks. Well, this time I still didn't get a chance to advance further into the story, but I did at least have the opportunity to test some fancy settings. Ultra quality with high ray tracing was a real challenge, with the average FPS failing to hit 50. Turning on maximum quality DLSS boosted that average to 84. And although some of the specular highlights get a bit weird with DLSS enabled, on the whole I think it's a compromise I'm happy to make. <laughs> Here's a blast from the past. I played Halo Combat Evolved on Windows XP to death in 2003. This and Doom 3 were the primary drivers of my PC upgrades back then. I actually never played any of the sequels until the MCC released on PC, and I have to admit they were definitely worth the hype, even if I was uh, a decade and a half late to the party. The single player stories are awesome, and it's really a shame we don't see sci-fi shooters like this anymore. Although the anniversary edition of Combat Evolved released on PC a couple of years ago, it's still based on an Xbox 360 game, so it's unsurprisingly light on quality options and doesn't tax the system at all. I could almost max out a 240Hz monitor at 1440 with max settings. I do an excited little wee when people talk about Doom 2016. My first FPS obsession was Quake, which 
if you haven't played it yet, check out the new remaster. It's Doom 2016 was, for me, a thoroughly modern Quake successor, and it's worthy of every good thing anyone's ever said about it. I like what I've played of Doom Eternal, but 2016 was just the right game at the right time, and it's hard to replicate that kind of thing. Replaying it in the wake of Doom Eternal, I have to say on a few occasions I really did miss some of the mobility and quality of life improvements of the sequel, but it was still a blast. Given how well it performed on release, I recall it was being used to show off the RX 480 when that card came out, it shouldn't be any surprise that 1440 Max settings sees averages of almost 200 FPS. Jedi Fallen Order is actually my first stab at a Soulsborne inspired game. I'm a former Star Wars nerd, f you Disney. TIE Fighter was actually the first game I bought on the PC back in 1994, and I thought if anything could get me into Souls games, it was a Star Wars Souls game. Well, so far it hasn't done that, but I am enjoying the game nonetheless. Fallen Order doesn't have an unlocked frame rate option in the menu. Maybe it's possible there's a way of unlocking it, but I didn't really see the point. Running at 1440 Epic saw the game hammering against the monitor's 144 FPS sync speed frequently, though thanks to the game's tendency to stutter when loading in new areas, 1% lows dipped into the low 80s, and 0.1% lows actually dropped into the 30s. I have been holding on to some hope that Respawn will get round to fixing this in the PC version, as by some accounts the 9th gen console versions of the game are much better in this regard. And the aptly named Sir not appearing in this film. There's so many games I could have featured here that I've loved over the years. Quake, Doom 3, Max Payne 1 and 2, Half-Life 1 and 2, and Crisis were all formative experiences for me, but not exactly challenging for a modern PC to benchmark. Valorant is a fun distraction, but I only really play it for deathmatch. I play Rocket League from time to time. I just completed Resident Evil Village, which is actually my first RE game this century. <laughs> no, don't, don't put it like that. Uh, it's the first full Resident Evil I've played since RE2 on the PlayStation. I'm currently playing through Horizon Zero Dawn on my new laptop for the first time outside of a benchmarking run, and I'm enjoying it very much. But I benchmark Horizon, Rocket League and Village all the time, and I didn't want this video to be a complete rehash of my others. Anyway, enough about me, let's talk about the channel. I'm putting together a list of games for the Versus 2022 benchmarking suite, which should be mostly new releases like Far Cry 6, Battlefield 2042, Forza Horizon 5, possibly Guardians of the Galaxy? Let me know your thoughts below, um, though I'm not making any promises. I've got a video where I talk about my graphics card test platform, the RPG PC, in that video I've asked for feedback about the test PC, whether you'd rather see me testing out GPUs on a higher performance PC, or if you prefer my more budget conscious build. If you have thoughts on that, either check out that video or comment below. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.